where it's cold and gray. But when the sun's gonna shine through the shadows when I go away, I don't want no sorrow for this old open door. I don't want no crying, only tears of joy. Remembering all that you have been 
clothing When suddenly you lifted me out of myself Through that window I was taken somewhere else
I hid my face so he would not see me cry. So he would not see me cry. So he would not see me cry. But he came close, dried my tears with his robe. I buried my face deep within his folds. He told me not to worry, for my fate had always been entwined with his, and I would always be with him. I would always be with him. Always be with him. I dreamed he took me high top a golden hill and said this world only exists because it is my will. So do not try to change that which was meant to be You are mine now Your surrender Is your gift to me It is your gift to me Your gift to me I dreamed I saw my Savior come for all mankind. When I awoke, I was surprised to find that somehow in that night so dark, lonely you had come. Your compassion to make my dream come true. To make my dream come true. To make my dream come true. Garden from his own neck, and he placed it up 
people of the world want to be free. Things. 
Rejecting all beneath the blue dome of the sky Read not for this passing show But remember something I once heard From a fellow traveler who was passing by He said on the ties or not Which is binding up your forehead Except with joy What fate provides for you and me Your destiny is fixed We may not open it Though we may try We simply haven't got the key So go ahead and we Heartbroken nightingale is the place of weeping and never trust the treacherous smile of the faithless rose it is a promise that she never tends on keeping And alone, I was sitting in the tavern. Oh, how can words ever express the things I heard? The angel Gabriel came to me, bringing a message from the other world with his angelic voice. He spoke to me these words. said, great falcon, can't you see? You are a noble bird of vision. You don't belong here in this world of pain and vice. A nest in heaven waits for you. First assume your lofty stature. You will find it high and top the tree of paradise. Oh, can't you hear? The royal falconer is whistling for you. They are calling you back to paradise from here below. Oh, tell me why are you so reluctant to return there? What is it about this world that fascinates you so? place of weeping and never trust the treacherous smile of the faithless rose it is a promise that she never intends on keeping It was taught to me by a master of the way If you will take it to your heart And then put it into practice You may find it is of use to you one day Expect nothing from this world for she will never be faithful She is unstable Always changing with the wind Do not be tempted by her smile For she is nothing but an aging bride Throughout the ages She has been married to a thousand men Now tell me why do you poets nurture so much envy? For 
these lovely verses that pop is as strong for you. His gracious heart and lovely speech were given to him by the hand of God. So what else could he do? Well, go ahead and we are broken nightingale. place of weeping and never trust the treacherous smile of the faithless rose it is a promise that she never intends on keeping it is a promise that she never
morning, the birds sing out his praises. In the night, the cricket chatter of his ways. Shall we not shout his name aloud while we have the chance? Here, Baba! Shall we not share with all the world this divine romance and sing a song for me?
coming. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Janice and uh, Angelo. Thank you. We're going to have a drawing in a minute and a fundraiser, so uh, submit your wallets and your checkbooks out. And then when you write a check, just say this. Ustad Danyabad, 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 when we have an artist, especially an artist as good as Jamie Newell, we just don't give them one round of applause. Maybe after Baba was passed, Baba passed away, so it was 60, maybe I don't mean 70 or 71. So in 71, a big car kind of uh, comes into the boarding school, and out come three people, three ladies. And uh, the three ladies were uh, Elizabeth and uh, Jane Haynes and uh, Wendy. And uh, two ladies and uh, uh, I think Wendy was 10 or 12, or maybe a little older than that time. And they called me that uh, these people have come to visit you. Now imagine this, you're in a boarding school it's an all-boys school, right? Uh, and then these people say, what are these foreigners come to meet you for? <laughs> and I remember saying, wow, okay. So then I went and, and I had no idea about all that. So then I meet these people and I, I meet uh, Elizabeth and she could kind of talk and then Jane was there and so we naturally talked. And so it was all mostly formal discussion and all that. And uh, so I'm kind of regretting the whole thing till Elizabeth gets into the car and brings out a big box. And that box was, uh, it, it was one of those fit-in pieces and you build a model. And so she gives me a model of the Enterprise, the USS Enterprise, the ship. <laughs> and when I see that, I said, hey, this wasn't, these foreign ladies are not so bad. <laughs> And uh, so then I take that and, and so and naturally at this point I'm very kind of uh, much in two minds. Is it a good thing or a bad thing, right? This whole thing that is happening. The good thing was after she gifted me with the, the uh, model, I became a very popular boy in the school, right? <laughs> Everybody wanted to be my friend and so uh, we had, we, we used to have a big, big kind of a shower room and our shower room had 12 showers all in one one room and it had a big kind of a, like a nice little ledge uh -huh. so we kind of assembled the whole thing the model of the enterprise and then we filled the whole thing with water <laughs> and this was the whole group so all my wow. friends and all and then it had batteries and a motor and it had flashing lights and, oh my that, that that was one of the best toys <laughs> i mean in india you get a toy like that and it's just un, uh, very unusual and so kind of i really enjoyed that so i said maybe it might not be so bad <laughs> but then after i started so that that was the, the, those are my memories of that time uh, I guess I should tell you also, uh, the, another thing that I remember when I was 10 was uh, I, I saw Baba when Baba was uh, at Dara and Amrit's wedding. So he was there for the wedding in Merazad. And so the only thing I remember is I'm, I walked by, the, by Merazad and so Baba is standing on the, the veranda there and he has a microphone and he is just speaking something and things like those. And a thought that still kind of is my, in my mind is, I thought, Baba really looks tired in that one. So in fact, that's what happened with Baba. This was 10th of December or something like that, and then Baba passed away within a little 
a month and a third, he passed away December 31st. So that, that was my other memory. So these things are happening. My mother, who was a very strong, a very strong follower of Baba, always was, it was like, for her, it was like, there's nothing to be told to you. You are a Baba person, so why are you even worried about that? That was her kind of reaction to anything that I challenged her about. So, And uh, my, my mom was uh, always kind of a, that way a Baba lover. My whole family was also a Baba lover. In fact, my grand uncles, they, they always used to tell me that, uh, well, you saw Baba, but we have heard Baba. Because they met uh, Baba when Baba used to speak. And this was, must be in 19, uh, I think Baba st stopped talking in 19. 24. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 1925. So yeah, this was before that. So they used to walk from uh, uh, Akbar Press to uh, Merabad. And so that was, that, that was the way I, I kind of grew up. So I'm growing up, I'm in the boarding school and all that. And then uh, you, they, start, they teach you various things. So they teach you, one of the things they teach you is uh, the theory of evolution, right? <laughs> And I guess quite a few of you must be of a scientific background, and so Darwin's theory of evolution. And so when Darwin's theory, when we started learning that, and then I said, well, if everything has evolved, where is the question of God, right? Yeah. Because everything has evolved, once, one, one thing led to the other. And so, so for, for, for quite a while I felt that this whole thing about God itself is kind of uh, not right. And I, I went through that for quite a while, and uh, I started thinking about that, and I, I see that in my kids also. When my kids learn about evolution, and when I talk to them about evolution, it's like they feel so strongly, and I feel the scientific community has done a great job of selling Darwin. <laughs> But then at some point I started thinking about, oh yeah, and in fact I should tell you why I started thinking different. So then I went into engineering school, and in engineering school you start designing things, and then for quite a while in my career I also was a design engineer. So when you start designing things, you begin to look at what it takes to design a simple thing. I used to design machine tools. Machine tools are tools that will do things in an automatic manner. So you have to kind of uh, conceptualize the whole thing and then start actually looking at how the action will happen at the point the cutting thing happens and then based on that you develop the whole machine. And then you have to draw it out first on uh, a CAD or computer-aided design or on paper and then you build it and then it comes to life. And after I started designing, and then I started looking at things in the nature, and then you start looking at a leaf, or a stem, or simple things. And then when you look at those, you begin to say, wait a minute, for designing this thing that I'm designing, it took me so much effort, and these people are trying to convince me that this has evolved, and that's when I started really challenging the whole Darwin's theory. And in fact, uh, at this point, I have really looked into Darwin's theory and uh, started looking into what he said and what reality is. And in fact, <laughs> we were sitting at the dining table looking at the leaf with the with Baba's initials there. Do you see that? Now, most of you would have appreciated the signature on the leaf. But we missed appreciating the leaf. I mean, there, has, there is much more that has gone into making the leaf than it has gone into just engraving that name on that. But we become so accustomed to looking at things and we just say, okay, well, what's, what's this? This is no big deal. And that's when I started looking into this whole thing. Now, 
the way it happened in my case was first I had to even believe that there is a God and then you begin to believe oh yes and that is Baba so it's like a two-step thing right <laughs> first you believe that it can be possible first so if you really look at uh, anything that happens in um, in nature and in fact then I started looking at what uh, some of you might know as the concept of uh, design and the concept of intellectual design. I don't know how many of you have kind of read about that or researched that. I would encourage you to look into that. The concept of intellectual design. Intelligent. Sorry, intelligent design. Thank you, intelligent design. So intelligent design, the whole idea there is everything that you see has been designed. And then I ran into an instance where you started, there was, there was an example of a, what is called a flagellum. And a flagellum is like a small kind of a bacteria which kind of goes through, uh, which, which uh, locomotes, which moves, uh, moves in some kind of a medium. And when it moves in the medium, it uses its tail. So it's got its tail and the tail rotates and allows the bacteria to kind of move from one place to the other. And so if you look into that, we look at it from Darwin's point of view. What Darwin said was, little by little, everything happened. So by having, and the way it happens, it's all a matter of something going wrong or something not getting you to the right point. And because of that, evolution happens and then you come to the final point. Now the problem with that kind of thinking is if in the first place you did not have that rotating motor, how could it have improved? So to, for improving something, you need to first at least have the action going. Now just take a simple example of the flagellum. The flagellum has this rotating tail, which rotates at a rotation of 100,000 RPM. Wow. The flagellum rotates at 100,000 RPM, wow. and it stops in a quarter of a circle, and then it can begin to rotate in the opposite direction wow. when the bacteria wants to go in the opposite direction. Wow. How can you not see a miracle in that? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's really, it's those kind of things I started looking at that. And there is What's that? Creation is miracle. <laughs> really? Um, but no, but the thing is, we miss out on the miracles because we don't look at it that way. Yeah. And by the way, if, if, I'm, if I'm explaining something and you have a question, please feel free. We'll kind of talk about it also. So not a problem. Yet. There is a, so, so when designing, I found that there is a insect which has a kind of a, a the insect's legs are such that it's got a, like a gear built on it. And the gear is such that it can load itself with the gear like a toggle and then it releases it so that it can jump some 300 times its height. Wait a minute, I said, wait a minute, and, and you say it evolved? Now, we're talking about insects and bacteria and things like those. We haven't even come to humans or we haven't even come to bigger things. But we say it's evolved. It's all evolved. So at some point, I started thinking differently. And when I started thinking differently, I said, there is no way this evolution thing can work. It has to be something that has been designed. And with, even with a, uh, the engineering and a scientific education, I just feel it's just unbelievable that something can evolve. Even look at atoms. Look at the nuclei, the protons, the electrons. How could that evolve? I mean, it's just unreal. It has to have been put up, put there. How can you have so many different elements? What is magnetism? We don't even understand magnetism. What's that? Some magic energy behind everything. Exactly. There is. So that's, that's when I started believing that, well, there is no way that this has evolved. And so, in fact, the way I look at it these days, 
I try to see a miracle in everything. I mean, you, you can start looking like that. You will, in fact, the other day I was looking at, it, it was like the, a shell for a seed. And this is a seed. And the way the shell works, it's like a five or six leaves are there. And it opens, those five leaves or six leaves, they open. And there's a seed, there's a seed inside. And when you look at that, each of those leaves has got a, what we in engineering terms would call a gusset. A gusset is something that we use to strengthen a part so that it does not fall apart. And looking at that, I said, wait a minute, there's a gusset in this? Where did that come from? I mean, truly, you, if you begin to look at no, we haven't even gone into photosynthesis or what all happens in the cell or we haven't even gone into the DNA or the RNA or how this whole thing creates. So I mean, once you begin to look at miracles, it's just unreal how many miracles you can see. So that's the so at that point I, I began to believe that there, there is no way that I mean I'm I'm convinced. And and here's here's another thing. I'm talking of the smaller things. I, I, we haven't even got into gotten into space or the planets. <laughs> Or, or the universe or things like this. And in fact, one of the theories that I ran into, which kind of I really liked was this, uh, th this, uh, there's a cluster of these uh, microbiologists and uh, biochemists. And they have come up with a theory, they call it uh, irreducible complexity. Mm. And the concept of irreducible complexity is when Darwin, he kind of looked at the whole thing and we come, came up with the theory of evolution, the belief was that at some point, we will find that everything is the same. All matter is the same. So, because Darwin was maybe 100, 125, 150 years from today, right? So that time there was no microscope. We couldn't see the miniature things of what happened. And so that time the thinking was, at some level, Everything will be the same. Mm -hmm. But now as we look into that, we have found that the cell itself is a factory by itself. So each cell is a factory that needs to have a means of removing the waste, bringing in the energy, performing the things that needed to be performed. Then you have the DNA that is used for creating the, another cell, and then cell division happens. It's just un unreal. <laughs> the other thing that really impresses me is, think about it this See, think about it this way. To make any kind of a product or any kind of a machine, we need to come up with a drawing, right? We come up with specifications. So as an engineer, that's what we do. We come up with a whole set of drawings. I mean, for a house, let's take for a house. A good example is for a house. If you want to build a house, what you do is you need plans for the house. Mm -hmm. We do the same thing for a product, or we do the same thing for a machine. You need to come up with a whole set of plans that exactly say which part is going where and how that part needs to be made so that you can make that part or make that machine. The cell has no such drawings. You know where the drawings are in the cell? In the DNA. The DNA itself has all the plans of how to make the cell. Now, how can you make a product, the product has been designed, that has the drawings built in itself to make itself? And we say, that, is, that has evolved, that has just come about, and we don't even give it a second thought. It's just amazing that we've come to a point where we allow that to happen. So these kind of things really made me feel, there's no way, I mean, I'm convinced that this is there is, there is some power, some power that does that. Now, one of the, one of the things that really made me look at Baba <coughs> in that sense, and one of the things that really, I took it as a miracle from Baba, was the time when Baba passed away, and uh, when Mera was feeling lonely, Baba's picture, Baba's form, came on that uh, Urak tree outside her, outside her room. And uh, I was fortunate enough to actually see that on the tree. Not only did I see it on the tree, 
I went, I made sure I go around and I saw it this close to exactly see wow. what is it. Because I wanted to know how did that come about. <laughs> and when I saw that, I said, wait a minute. This is not natural. In um, in our in my field, I'm, I'm, I'm a manufacturing and an industrial engineer. And so in my field, we say that uh, if something is within the limits of how it should be, then the process or the product is in control or the process is stable. We call it stable. So what is a stable process for a tree? That the trunk is just uniform. Maybe there are some branches, there are leaves, all that is stable and all that is regular. When you see a face on the trunk, <laughs> that tells you this is not normal. <laughs> this is out of the realm of things that can happen on a normal basis. And in fact, what is the probability of that happening on a tree? What is the probability of that happening on a tree outside Mera's window? <laughs> and what is the probability of that happening so that Mera can see it straight out of her window? There is no way that it can. No, no, I mean, I, I, okay. The other thing that I've always felt is, I mean, I have heard a lot of you come and told, tell, tell me miracles with Baba, experiences with Baba, things that Baba has kind of allowed you to see. And sometimes I feel, Baba, where are my miracles? I didn't see something so. <laughs> but this was a miracle for me in a way, because I felt that, yes, just by looking at what Baba managed to do, and what uh, happened was good enough for me to believe that yes, there is, Baba is what he, is, he, he says that he is. Recently what has started to happen, what, what has started happening to me is, I have, uh, so we see Baba as a picture, right? We see Baba's picture. And I have started, as I have started looking more into studying more about the universe and more about how the planets are and things like those, I'm beginning to feel that Baba has really not showed himself fully to us. Or maybe that's not a good way to put it. Maybe we do not even have the capability, at least I don't feel I have the capability to understand what he's capable of achieving, or what he is, and what what he is truly there, because we do not have the capacity to understand that. And that is that has been a kind of a thing that is recently uh, I'm thinking in those terms. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, kind of uh, wrap up at least what I have to say, and then I'm going to open it up because I'm sure you have a lot of questions, and maybe our interaction might mean more to you than me just uh, rambling about various things. So that's what I'm going to do. But what I'm going to do first is, since I talked about the universe and uh, infinite, I'm going to do an exercise with you to help you appreciate what is infinite. Now, I'm not going to show you what infinite is, because that's be, that you can only show. <laughs> but let's do that exercise. So, So tell me, how far is India from here? 8,000 miles. 8,000 miles? It's a little more, yeah. He says 14, it's around 12,000. Okay, what is the diameter of the Earth? The diameter of the Earth is around 8,000 miles. 8,000 miles is the diameter of the Earth. So the diameter of the Earth is 8,000. So 8,000, so if you go halfway, so it'll be around 12, 15,000 miles. Let's say 15,000 miles. So, from here to India is 15,000 miles. What is the diameter of the known universe that at least we know about? How, try 93 billion. Now let's say the known universe is 93 billion miles. 93 billion miles. Now, from here to India is uh, 12,000. The known universe is 93 billion miles. No. It's actually 13.5 billion light years. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, you, you are ahead of me. You are ahead of me. 
Now, you know how fast light travels? miles. Yeah, good. 186,000 miles per second. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So, per second, 186,000 miles. The diameter of the known universe is not 93 billion miles. The diameter of the known universe is 93 billion light years. Now, let's understand what is a light year. A light year is the distance that light will travel in one year at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. You get the math now, right? So at the speed of 186,000 miles per second, light will take 93 billion years to get from one point in the universe to another point of the universe. Now, that's the known universe. So that is not infinity, right? So infinity is beyond that, which only he knows what, where, 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 where that is. So in our, so when we talk about things, we need to understand how small we are or how less we know of the whole thing. It's just unreal. When truly Baba says, I have infinite knowledge, you kind of, you kind of begin to believe. You say, yeah, well, what is infinity? A little more than what we know, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the approach what most people have. Infinity is a little more. I don't know what infinity is. So it'll be a little more than what I know. <laughs> so that's what it is. So infinite is truly what th that is. And so once we begin to appreciate that, and so, so I guess to wrap up at least what I have to say, begin to see beauty in everything, beauty in a leaf. I mean, the leaf itself is so many factories built into that. And we haven't even talked about other things like, like the eye, the beauty in the eye. How did the eye was, I was created? And in fact, the other day, my daughter, who's uh, taking science courses, she was telling me, oh, I'm reading a chapter on the evolution of the eye. <laughs> and, and, and she's, <laughs> these days, uh, so, so we, in fact, we have made a compromise these days. So uh, we have said that uh, what, uh, what our beliefs are, and in fact, every time she talks about evolution, uh, I kind of jump in and say, wait a minute, I mean, did you say evolution? <laughs> yeah. And so we have made a compromise. We said, okay, there is evolution. I do believe there is evolution. But evolution can only happen after something has been designed and put into place. So there's a combination of both. I mean, it's, it's evolved. Yeah, it does evolve. I mean, little by little, some improvement will happen. Yes. But something to come into existence just by itself is just not possible. And that, I mean, yeah, scientists would say anything, but yeah. And uh, in fact, if you are interested, uh, I, I take the, all this as Baba's because I mean, that's just uh, how the nature of uh, what Baba has created. There is a good set of videos and the title of that is uh, Where Does the Evidence Lead? Where Does the Evidence Lead? And in fact, they talk, in this case, they talk about uh, uh, intelligent design. And so, in fact, I highly recommend you kind of, uh, and it's all available on YouTube, so you can go and view that. And it's just kind of amazing. It kind of gives you an appreciation for what uh, Baba is and what how the whole thing has kind of come about and how we have been blind to this whole thing for all this time. Okay, so your questions. I'll go first. Yes. It's not a question, it's an observation. I'm a geologist and from the time I was a little kid I was interested in paleontology which, as you know, is the study of ancient life. And I started reading books on evolution from the time I was, well, time, life, and man, let's say that would be 19. I was 13, 14 years old, and then George Gaylord Simpson's books on evolution. And I actually went to college, went to graduate school, took a seminar in systematics. I never, never believed it was possible, intuitively, that you could get the complexity of form over the standard way of thinking of evolution. Because as you said, here's how it works. You have a random, random change in a gene. 
just a random one, which makes a random change in a protein, and then somehow that is good because the environment accepts it. And from that, and another random thing, and another random thing, and it's in, if you just do the mathematics, it's impossible, okay? I, I heard one guy, he was a pastor, and I thought it was just a great analogy. He said, what are the chances that if you had an explosion in a print shop that you'd come up with an unabridged dictionary? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's exactly the point. I mean, what there, the fact is, it's not going to happen to trillion years. Um, then in my systematics class, I had a very bright guy. He taught at the Museum of Natural History. And I would look at some of the things that were being published at the time, and I'd say, you know, this guy seems to indicate that there's some kind of a feedback mechanism that might go into genetics. In other words, inheritance of, quote, acquired characteristics was the old thing which was debunked. But now, in 2019, what do we have? We have exogenesis, which is simply the concept that experiences of an organism can actually be coded in its DNA. Well, then if you read Mayor Baba, he talks about the fact that our sanskaras accumulated during a lifetime make the pattern for the next form. And that evolution occurs from one form to another by the accumulation of more and more sanskaras, and therefore the need for a higher and higher form to be able to spend those sanskaras. Which means that in your lifetime and in my lifetime, we may actually see a total change in the understanding of evolution, which, believe it or not, proves Mayor Bobble right. <laughs> Let's hope so. You know, the other thing that I couldn't figure out is that every evolutionary theorist, right, talks about a material world only, that life is biologically based, and when life's biological functions are over, consciousness is done. There's no place in material evolution for the idea of discarnate consciousness in anything. And yet, then what happened in the 1970s? You started getting books like Life After Life, tons of tremendously well-documented stuff, which is documented now even more and more to this day, of discarnate experiences of people who have died, including one guy, foot and jamma, of uh, uh, some guys who died instantly of cardiac arrest. So there was no time for brain changes in chemistry. They were just dead, came back, and they all have these so many similar experiences. So if you can have discarnate consciousness, then there's a real easy way to see, right? Yeah. How you can code form for the next for the, so, you and I, even though you're an engineer, and I'm a geologist, and we tend not to talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Although I made, made, I made my life with it right, we come to the same conclusion. And I think any fair-minded person, the deeper they delve, find the same thing. So that's my little take on it. Yeah, and in fact, they did a calculation on what if, if there were these Scrabble letters, right. and if the Scrabble letters were dropped, how many combinations would be needed to form the words to be or not to be? <laughs> and they came up with some greater than 10,000 billion years. So if you kept throwing those letters for 10,000 billion years, then there is a possibility they might come to that to be or not to be. It's greater than 10,000 billion years. It's mind yes, sir. You say you see miracles in everything. What is the most, for lack of a better word, spectacular miracle you have ever seen in which you saw Baba's hand or face like on the tree or I'm thinking of Michael um, LePage's story of when he went to a naturopath and had some blood drawn, and they were looking at his blood under the microscope, and they actually, he, he and the examiner actually saw Baba's face in the blood work under the microscope. So what 
what similar, spectacular miracle have you experienced in your lifetime where you actually saw Baba's face or knew it was his hand directly? Okay, so you get the question. The question is, what is the most miracle that I have seen? Yes. Uh, like I said, I'm waiting for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and, but the thing is, I, I, I truly have come to a point where uh, I, I, I don't think uh, I need that miracle to happen. And so, but okay, I, I can tell you some ways that I, I believe Baba has saved me. So I, I can tell you an incident where uh, uh, in India, we, we don't have cars, right? We have motorcycles. And so this uh, one incident that happened was I was on a motorcycle and I was living in Ahmednagar at that time. I was in my mid-twenties and I had a job at, the, at, at a manufacturing company there in Ahmednagar and uh, had bought a motorcycle, very powerful motorcycle. It could go easy 65, 75 miles an hour. It was a kind of powerful motorcycle. And never occurred to me to own a helmet. So <laughs> now please don't tell this story to my kids. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So what had happened was I was, uh, I, I went from Amandagar, so a friend of mine and I, we went to Pune, and on the return, we were coming back in the night, and it must be around midnight, so it was late, we were traveling, and if you know anything in India, when you are going on the road, and if a truck comes from the front, you have to go down on the road, because there's not enough space for you to kind of pass, right? And what happened was, I was sitting, I was sitting behind my friend, and pretty much uh, put my head on his uh, shoulder and I was kind of literally taking a nap. <laughs> and so he's riding the motorcycle, both of us not wearing helmets. The truck comes from the front and it so happens that he, he sees that the truck and the motorcycle are going to cross on a bridge. Mm -hmm. oh. There's a bridge there, so we're going to cross right there. So naturally, looking at the bridge, he kind of becomes nervous and he kind of goes a little beyond what he should have gone. And he goes down on the shoulder, and we were we were maybe I'm sure we were 55, 60 miles an hour, and and when I woke up, <laughs> I woke up in the, in midair. I just was dazed, looked up, and it was just like it was all practiced, and I landed on my feet. I landed on my feet, and. The motorcycle is on one side, my friend is on the other, he's beaten up, and I'm just dazed and saying, oh, wait, wait a minute, what happened? <laughs> I was just, just unharmed totally. And then there was a car that came from behind. And so the car comes, and so the, naturally, the, it was nice of the car, the person, they stopped, and they kind of looked at, the, saw the whole thing that, was hap that happened. And my friend was beaten up like anything, his face was cut, his uh, back was hurting, he was just complaining away. And so I said, okay, let's, uh, let's put, I uh, kind of requested the car to take him to the hospital. He said, we're not going to wait for the ambulance or anything. So I put him in the car and we, uh, he kind of went to the hospital. <laughs> now, I guess I uh, should, should tell you a funny story there attached to this also. So in India, you know, we have something for the mustaches. In India, most Indians will have mustaches, right? Where is uh, Ravi? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm shaven now. <laughs> so what had happened was, uh, I had a friend in Mumbai. So at one point in time, uh, the, we kind of made a bet. And so the, both of us had mustaches then. And so he says that, so I, I was telling him, why are you so proud of your mustache? What does this mustache mean to you? And he said, oh, this is manlyhood and all, you know, that's the kind of thinking that we have in it. So I said, what would it take for you to shave off this mustache? 
So he said, if you shave yours, I will shave mine. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, get the razor. <laughs> so I took the razor and removed mine, so I had no mustache. So now this is a side story. So, so what had happened was now the friend who was sitting in front of me, he was the same. When, he, when I met him, he said, what did you do? You removed your mustache. I said, no, 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 that's fine. He said, I would never remove mine. I said, really? And so this, this is the friend who is now in front of the motorcycle. So I, I was joking and I'm telling him, if ever you want it removed, you let me know, I will shave it off. <laughs> now it so happens, we take this friend to the hospital, and the moment we reach the hospital, the nurse brings the razor. <laughs> she, he has a big cut, he, he, had, he had a cut like this, the whole thing was cut. And it was just bleeding away. And uh, she said, there's no way we can treat you till you remove your mustache. <laughs> oh. So now I don't know whether to laugh or whether to <laughs> this guy is beaten up. <laughs> so I got removed his mustache. <laughs> so and, and then the tear and all that. So but that, that wasn't the end of it. The next morning, his mother visits the hospital. Now he's in a hospital bed, right? I went to sleep home at home. His mother comes up to me and says, I have one question. You both were on the motorcycle. How come you got away without even a single cut? <laughs> I really felt bad then with this person. I mean, we are still friends, but that's how it happened. So I don't know whether what what role Baba played, but yeah, I was thankful. That's a nice story. So you have other questions? Yes, sir. Is Bono lost to your grandmother? Which one is your grandmother? No, Bano Masi, Bano Masi is my uh, grandma's sister. So there were. Uh, What's Four, your name? Yeah, my grandmother's name was Shirin. Uh -huh. So Shirin Mai, then uh, uh, Banu Mai, Gai Mai, and Gula Mai. Yeah. They were the four sisters, and then they had five brothers. And that, 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 that. And Gai Mai was Erish's mom. Right? Yeah, Gai Mai was Erish's mom, right. That's it. But well, if, when when you were um, you know growing up, um, I know you met Baba you know during the the wedding. But was he around? Because you were writing on the Nagar growing up. Was he around periodically? And oh well, Baba, yeah, Baba used to come a lot to Akbar Press, and so yeah, on on his way from uh, Mera Mera Merazad to Merabad, he would stop in and eat rice and dal, and you know, yeah, he, he used to always stop at Akbar Press, and. Uh, so yeah, I, I was also wondering what, what, should, what are my memories, my earliest memories of Baba. And then Jonathan the other day sends me a picture where uh, Baba is laughing away and uh, Dolly, I mean, uh, Roshan Kerala is laughing with Baba, so they are having some interaction. My mom is standing beside and uh, Gula Masi, that's uh, Guy Mai's, and this, is, this picture was taken at Bindra House, and Gula Masi is behind there. And Mera, uh, Roshan's daughter, is uh, standing there looking at Baba like that. Yes. And then there's a small boy crying away. <laughs> <laughs> and that was me. So. <laughs> I thought, okay, good, I'm still crying. So that's <laughs> Did Baba ever say anything directly to you that, like, as a, a direction directly to you or anything specific? No, I don't remember Baba saying anything to me. I don't know why, but Baba did say something to my father, my dad. And, uh, so, uh, so somebody told me that Baba had told my dad that uh, you will come six months after I've gone. Now that's kind of like a big uh, burden to live with, right? And that's and so I didn't think about it much. And so, but it did, did happen that way. Baba passed away in uh, January, January thirty first, sixty nine, 
and my dad passed away on 25th August 1969, the same year. So it did happen, six months, maybe seven months, which <laughs> in that, uh, I guess the divine calendar, a month here and there is. <laughs> but what happened after that was, I was in uh, India, and one, one, guy, one person came up to me, he's an Indian, and he came up to me and he said, have you heard that uh, Baba told your dad that uh, six months after he goes, he's going to come? I said, yeah, I heard about it, but I didn't think much about it. He said, well, when Baba did that, Baba told your dad that I was in the room. When he said that, I said, you were in the room and actually this happened. He said, yes, I was in the room when this conversation happened. So naturally, my thing was, why did he tell him that? What was the significance? Hmm. He don't, He said, well, something happened, and so he was talking, and he said, well, six months after that, you were coming. <laughs> something like that. Hmm. So, How yeah. did your father die, then? How, what was the cause my, of my father, My father passed away. He had a heart attack. Oh. Hmm. And uh, in fact, that was another thing. When, when, when you lose your dad, and so you, I, I was 10. And you always wonder whether something more could have been done. And so the way it happened was, uh, my father, so I was in the school in Pune, and I went to Ahmednagar, and uh, in the evening I met, I met my father, he kind of uh, wasn't feeling very good. The next day he goes to work, and then there was a, in, near Akbar Press there was another kind of a room, so he was resting there. And he calls me and says, okay, just massage my back. Just. And then he said that the cardiologist is going to come today to check me out. In India, the doctors will come to your house and check you out. So the cardiologist comes and this Dr. Shilgikar, he kind of comes. And so when he comes, he's right in the room. He checks my dad. They talk about his health and all that. I'm 10 years old. I listen, I just play, I go in and out, and I'm just listening to what is happening. And he leaves. Within 10-15 within seconds of him leaving, he was just at the door, and my dad gets a massive heart attack. And he, he begins to take uh, deep breaths and <sighs> like that. I mean. And so naturally, I run and say, I have to bring the doctor back in. And I bring the doctor back in. Now, this is a cardiologist, and there's the best person that could have been there <laughs> if, if he was to live, right? And that's the way I looked at it. I said, well, the best person who could have saved my dad was there. Yeah. And immediately, Shelgeeker, the Dr. Shilgikar, he started giving him CPR, naturally, he was a cardiologist. And he couldn't save him. Yeah. So, when such things happen, you think, well, it was destined. So, it's, 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 it was to happen. So, this, so, in a way, that helped me kind of. Oh, what, <laughs> what year was? This is 1969. Oh, uh, 25th, oh, yeah, I forgot, yeah. 25th of yeah. August, yeah. That's about when Duncan passed. Yes, uh, Duncan passed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Getting back to, the, I'm not a scientist, but I just wanted to throw this out because I had heard this once it expressed and it made sense. And that was that the whole range of creation, you know, from the littlest amoeba to human, was, in all the physical universes, was all created in an instant, along with the mechanism, evolution, if you will, to so that everything goes through that process. And that might be true, actually. Yeah. So hey. what? Was, yeah. In other words, it didn't, people think, well, it started out as something small and eventually it came to a human. But this, this theory says that everything was created in an instant along with the mechanism of evolution that everything goes through. So but the yeah. Yeah. but the dinosaurs were well, dinosaurs were not created at the same time as the humans. But yeah, I mean, yeah. well, I mean, I, I know, the, well, the way I look at it, there's a knows, further, right? there's a further, <laughs> only Baba knows. So. There's a further <laughs> explanation of this because this came from a Vedic teaching, and the understanding in that tradition is the the Vedas are not words; they're a verbal expression of the virtual fluctuations in the unmanifest silent field of all possibilities. And that, so that the same thing, so like when there's a Mahaprabhaya, the, the same creation comes out according to the sequence of 
uh, that's in that virtual field. Mm. Yes, and my Obama said exactly right now. There's another world ready to go if anything happens mm. to this. And that could also be that's true. That's food for thought. Yeah, it's ready to go. We may get there quick. <laughs> well, the way I look at it, we know so, so little. About everyone else. It's, just, it's just amazing, huh? So I talked to you about infinite to distance. Now talk about infinite knowledge. What would that be? It's just unreal. But yeah, it's when you say infinite, it's just unreal. What, it it could all. I mean, it could just. It's truly beyond our imagination. So it's just truly beyond imagination. Well, that, actually, actually, that's a, one of the points of infinite intelligence. That book is that the. There's two aspects. We either turn inward or we look outward. If we turn inward, we can experience our true self. If we look outward, our imagination, whatever we experience, the most distant thing, we can always imagine something beyond that. So it's, it, so it's a field of infinite possibilities going outward, creating new things, or if we look inward, then eventually we realize who we are in the end. Yeah. Well, what I could tell you is some of the things that I try to remember when, when we talk about Baba, what the, the, some of the things that I always try to keep in mind is the first one is be in the world, but not of the world. And so in whatever I've tried to do, I kind of keep that in mind. That's the whole idea there. At the same time, Baba said that uh, I, I can do everything, but then I cannot make you like each other or make you work together with each other. And so that is up to truly up to us how we create this uh, environment where we can trust and uh, love each other to be able to do the things that we need to do. So that is another thing that. And I, I guess the other thing also is uh, I, I used to have a bad temper. So at some point, uh, <laughs> no. What's that? No. Well, yeah, uh, and and I, I guess the bad temper thing was. At one point, one of my cousin brothers, he kind of irritated me for some reason. I don't know, I must be maybe 19 or 20 that time. And somehow there was a hatchet there. Threw <laughs> 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 it in the hatchet. I was so thankful that it missed. <laughs> but after that point, I decided that at no point uh, will I let my temper just go r run by itself? And so <laughs> I always try to keep that. That's it. Okay, thank you very much.